I recently took a look at this really interesting motherboard that features the 4-core Intel J2850 CPU, which only has a TDP of 10 watts. I ran into a small problem though when the board just didn't post at all. After attempting most of the solutions that I could think of, I tried turning to my incredible YouTube audience for advice. Considering that you probably read the title of this video, I'm sure by now that you realize I was able to fix it thanks to their help. But if you're curious to see what the solution was, as well as how this 10 watt quad core performs, stick around. I've been working on computers for a while now, and I feel like I have a decent understanding of how to repair and troubleshoot when things aren't working properly. So when I couldn't get this HP motherboard to post in my last video, I was confident that it was simply dead, and that sucks. You might be wondering why I care about a motherboard like this, especially if you primarily use PCs for gaming, and that makes sense. This CPU isn't very powerful, and it's soldered to the motherboard, so it isn't even upgradable. But the 10 watt TDP means that this thing should barely sit power, so it could be great for something running 24-7, like a NAS, web server, game server, or many other things. I wasn't incredibly hopeful for any chance of saving it, but thought, why not, and posted the video anyway to see if someone could spot something that I missed. Almost immediately, I had a ton of comments pointing out that this processor requires DDR3L memory, unlike the standard DDR3 I used when testing. Even though I've worked a lot on computers, and plenty of them being laptops, I never knowingly came across L or low voltage memory before. And if you're wondering how someone with a YouTube channel about computers could be so oblivious to something like this, well, you must be new around here, so welcome to the channel. DDR3L operates at only 1.35 volts, unlike standard DDR3, which requires 1.5 volts. And this seemed to be the most likely cause of why our machine wasn't booting up. Thanks to the awesome people over on my Patreon, I was able to head on over to eBay and find two sticks of crucial 4GB DDR3L 1600MHz memory for around $20. I made sure they even had the HP branding to hopefully improve my chances of compatibility. I popped one DIMM into what appeared to be labeled as the number one memory slot and tried firing it up, and to what is probably no surprise to many of you, it posted. It showed our one 4GB DIMM and also showed that the CPU is in fact a J2900 rather than the J2850. I wasn't exactly sure of the CPU SKU when I made the last video, because there were some discrepancies between the store listings for the pre-built this motherboard comes from, and HP's own website. But having the J2900 is better because it has a slightly higher burst frequency of 2.67 GHz, so I'm very much happy with being wrong in this situation. Since I already had everything cleaned and assembled, I went ahead and installed Windows 10 to see how well this could work as a basic usage PC, as well as run some other benchmarks. This board would probably benefit from a lighter Linux operating system, but I chose Windows for a few reasons. First, most people prefer or are just used to Windows. So if I were to give this away to someone to use for basic web browsing, checking emails, and watching videos, it would be helpful for it to be able to run Windows 10 well. I also want to be able to compare this PC to some of the others I've tested in the past using Windows 10, primarily the HP 500-C60, which also features a low-power quad-core CPU, the AMD A6 5200. After giving Windows time to install all the drivers and such, navigating around the OS was not too bad. I wouldn't describe it as snappy by any means, but definitely usable. Applications didn't take forever to load, and web browsing was fairly smooth. With our handy dandy H264 FI extension, watching YouTube videos was a very smooth experience, except for a few dropped frames here and there, primarily when the resolution or viewport changed. The CPU load while watching 1080p60 content wasn't too high for a machine this old. I don't usually look at gaming, but I was curious to see how this would handle some light 2D games, so I started with the best game of all time, Hollow Knight. 1080p was a no-go, but at 720p, we were able to get an almost playable and very cinematic 24 to 30 frames per second or so on average. Simpler titles like FTL worked just fine, though this is to be expected. I also gave Steam's Remote Play another try with this, 
but like many PCs from this time period, the video decoding just really isn't quick enough to provide a latency-free experience. I doubt anyone is using this for gaming though, so let's go ahead and move on to a few benchmarks, starting with PC Mark 10. Because the CPU is so similar to the AMD A6 5200 I mentioned earlier, I'll be comparing their benchmark results and power draw. In the PC Mark 10 Essentials category, the J2900 scored a 3449, which is just a little bit higher than the A6 5200, which scored a 3291. In the Productivity category, the J2900 scored a 1932, while the A6 5200 scored a slightly higher 2163. Moving on to Cinebench R15 here, and both CPUs scored a 3 run average of 150. At this point, it would appear that, at least in terms of raw performance, these two chips are very similar. But how do they compare in terms of efficiency? Well, the J2900 pulled around 15 watts at idle, and 21 watts under full load, which was measured during a full Cinebench run. The A6500 was nearly identical at idle, only pulling 14 watts, but crept up to 27 watts under full load. I should point out that this isn't an incredibly accurate comparison though, because I wasn't able to use the same power supply for each system, since the Pavilion 500-C60 uses an external power supply, while the HP 200 G1 that the Intel chip is from uses an ATX power supply. So this isn't a fair comparison between processors, but should be somewhat fair when comparing the two systems overall. But considering that the J2900 performed identically in the Cinebench tests while using less power, I think we can conclude that it is slightly more efficient. I barely even need to mention thermals here, because the J2900 only hit a max temp of 22 degrees Celsius over ambient, and idled at around 12 degrees Celsius over ambient. I've had a ton of fun messing around with other low power motherboards I've tested, but I'm particularly excited for this one for a few reasons. The primary reason being expandability. Because this board features a few buy one PCIe slots, we can add in some SATA cards, network cards, and much more. And we also won't be limited by what power connectors the motherboard has because we actually have a real ATX power supply. I have a few ideas of how we could use this board, including using it to build a NAS that I actually need now that I have all this YouTube footage I have to work with. But if you have any ideas for what we should use this for in the future, leave a comment below. If you're new to the channel, consider hitting the subscribe button, and if you're not, those likes always help out. But that's about it for this one, so thanks for watching, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one.